This is the second of two videos looking at chapter three of Circle of Hands, the role-playing game from Adept Press. I really enjoyed this chapter. If I knew nothing else about this game, seeing information about this chapter would have made me purchase it. And I'm saying this because I want anybody watching this game who's curious uh, about it, I want you to understand that as I go through chapter by chapter, my intent was to remain as objective as possible. Well, remaining objective is becoming harder as I discover more and more about how the game is to be played has resonance with the way that I have come to play over my time in gaming. So to be clear, this is a game that is very much coming from my point of view, but this doesn't mean yet that I like or recommend this game. I don't know if this is a world in which I want to be involved as a player or game master. I don't know if these characters in these situations are anything that I'm interested in exploring. But what I do have a great deal of passion for is the way in which characters are brought to life, the way in which ventures are created, the way in which the game, as written, looks at a particular style of play, my style of play. And it's exciting for me to be able to read the, the results of someone's great effort in bringing this style of play into a written form to pass on to others. This is something that I've only flirted with. And what I see here not only reinforces things that I've discovered in play, which is nice and reaffirming, but also guides me to better or more replicable practices that will make some of the things that I really enjoy about this style of play easier to communicate and easier to do, which is fantastic. Hence, the gradual weakening of my desire to remain objective until I get all the way through to the end. The Venture Creation section of Chapter 3, Forging Steel, begins on page 54 and moves through to the end of that chapter on page 69. And more than anything else, this is a procedure for preparation of a game session, which does not involve preparation of a story or a plot. Now, it does involve the creation of people, places, things that you might encounter as characters. But it does not include linking those things together in any way. And I think the best expression of that in the text is how often it reminds you that the characters, these circle knights, are not sent to that place. They are not on a mission. They are not responding to a cry for help. They're there for their own reasons. Period. The things in that place, the people who dwell there, they all have their own lives, much like the Circle Knights have their own lives, and they are living them. What does that mean? It only means what it means when things come to intersect, when things, as the game says, cross each other in play. As the Game Master, as the person preparing for a session of play, you are not pushing or pulling or twisting things together. You are placing things in a situation. And what people actually choose to do in their role as the character, presenting that character 
as they are described on their character sheet, presenting them, playing them. Only those things create story. Written as instructions, I find the content of this part of chapter three to be very easy to follow. I think it would be easy to follow for people who have, like myself, got a play style which matches with this or people who don't. You can read it. You can understand very clearly what to do. It's procedural, right? Do this, then do this, then do this. Check to see that you have done these things. You know, it's written like an instruction manual, complete with very clear examples of someone doing exactly what they're telling you to do. Now, the purpose behind doing it this way is to get you playing this game to help you not drag your old games into this. It has chapter headings like situation, not scenes. Scenes arise from play. Situation is prepared. Right? What is in the town in which the knights you know, have chosen to be? I think if you are completely new to this approach or this point of view, that maybe some of these things will not really begin to click until two things happen. One, moving on into chapter four, where it talks about actual play. And two, actual play. This doesn't mean that you would like it. If it's completely alien, I think it would take several plays. You would have to first learn how, then understand what you've learned, and then recognize within yourself that this is something that you want to continue, that this is answering the call of something missing from previous play or scratches an itch that you maybe didn't know that you had. If the play is not fun and enjoyable, etc., etc., then you know that this game is not for you at that point. Now, in the beginning, we had a lot of focus on the concept of lines and veils, and here in the opening of preparing a venture, we return to that concept again, because it reminds us that when you are preparing a, a venture, many things will be determined by the random roll of dice, but also many things will not be. And of primary importance in those things are that which is generated as part of the situation may skirt along lines that your group has. And so you need to be able to react in preparing according to those lines. As we continue with this video, I'll be using the word Game master and player, as they are so commonly understood, which is the same decision I think that the author reached with not trying to rename the game master. Although, very, very clearly, it spelled out what the game master does in this game. Less so who the game master is, because, as we've discussed elsewhere on this channel, the game master is a player who does specific things. So in the situation not scenes section in the, on the first page, it talks about the role of that player. And two questions should be arising in your mind as you move through this chapter for the first time. I'm not sure where this is going to go. Is this really enough, right? Is this enough for a session? I'm not sure where, where these elements will take us, right? I'm not sure where what I've prepared will go. I'm not sure if, if it's enough. These are good questions. The author reassures you, I reassure you. These are good questions, right? They say that the operating principle is to prepare the situation, just the situation. What does that mean? What does that really mean? According to the author, the operating principle is strictly to prepare the situation, 
but not the scenes to be played, leaving undetermined how any person in the fiction will think, react, and judge. The GM doesn't even know and shouldn't know which circle knights will be chosen for play. The players will choose them only in the context of specific limited details. You don't prepare for specific characters. You do not prepare the reactions of specific characters in the situation. You do not prepare for ties, pulls, bonds, calls for help, directives to go. You simply prepare the situation. We've probably said that enough. So with that little bit of advice to the person who will be acting as the game master about what their role really is, and this will be explained, let's say, more completely in chapter four. So we'll talk about it with chapter four. Let's go through the procedure. Step number one is location. This step is rolled. You roll your 3d6 again, the black, the white, and the red. You're going to keep these results as you go through the procedure, so don't discard them. Keep the dice visible and have scratch paper to write it down. So you'll look at the dice and the first roll will help determine where this takes place. Easy enough. And then it's an opportunity to create. So you'll name the place. You will think where within that kind of vaguely defined region or subculture, where exactly is this place, this town, this community, this region, you know, the small region? Where is it? What do they do there? Commerce, festivals, uh, clothing styles, favorite foods, the way they treat their dead. Be inspired by the backdrop and create these so that it it feels like that place or begins to establish patterns that will help you over many ventures make it feel like that place but nothing else just situation goes into advice on how to make names and the patterns in here the patterns encoded in that advice will again help reinforce certain aspects of what life in the crescent land is like how it works then we move into a second area which is called components and the use of the term components is important i feel because it it voids the problem generated by other terms which usually get used to do this job in this kind of preparation and that might be story hook plot point seed Right? All of these things are connected with too much, say, narrative control on the part of the game master. Too much pre-planning of events rather than situation. So that term is not used. Very intentionally not used. We have components. These are story elements. Yes, but there's no story attached. So we have seven different choices and the original results are manipulated in order to get one to three results from from this list and the suggestions that go along with it again getting the situation to be generated or inspired in the game master's mind then you determine the tone right so you'll be using this tone to guide your creative process when you're generating the situation Right. It's not something that you will enforce in play so much, except that this is something that informs the situation from the beginning. So it may be harsh. The people in this place struggle to survive. There are tough decisions to be made, or there's personal sorrow involved. It might be grim. So there's injustice present, or there are tragedies present, or traumas, desperation, or it may be what's called squick, <laughs> which deals with agony, atrocities, dehumanization, repulsion. What is the tone of the situation when the characters arrive? 
Then the components are refined. Again, this is happening creatively from the inspiration drawn from the list. You'll generate uh, a number of characters, one to three, named characters with deeply felt grievances or goals. Right? Confusing and potentially dangerous locations, it says. And something that's referred to as a tripwire, right? which are conditions which provoke some kind of action. You will then decide what each component is specifically, right? Within the component and among the components. And most importantly, I feel, the among the components section takes pains to identify that yes, these components happen in the same place and they potentially affect one another because they're in the same place. But you, as the preparer of this venture, do not have to make connections between them. It says stop and don't do that at all. Don't do it. Yes, it may be possible. Yes, it may seem like a really good idea. Yes, it seems like a really clever hook. Don't do it. If you do it, two things happen. One, you will not be playing this way, which if you want to play this way is important. Two, you will prevent play as written from working the way it should. And your ability to discover things in play will be compromised by that decision. It's not to say that that type of play is wrong. It doesn't say that at all. It says that this is the way to play this game. I hope that distinction is clear without sounding like something I don't mean. As you generate characters and as you generate the other components that will be in the location, you keep using those originally rolled results. And that will help you set uh, you know, the attributes and things like that. And finally, it comes down to maps and locations, which I think is interesting. Uh, many of us play without maps. We play without miniatures and whatnot. And this reinforces that idea, except in terms of one very specific location. This would be kind of like a battle map in in other games. But here it's something just to really refine the situation down to the now. It's not a grid map with movement. It's not something on which you would place minis. It's the thing that says you are here. That one image. The author recommends using the image just once show it briefly to give everybody a sense of the type of place they are in and then move on and continue to focus on the character one thing i think people will appreciate when they read it rather than just talk about these images the author presents some there's some fantastic maps in the book by dyson logos and we're treated to several right here right in that part the maps help inspire and inform characterization according to the atmosphere of the place. This is what I'm talking about. This whole game is written from that point of view. This is what to do. Here's an example. This brings us to tripwires. And this, again, is one of those tricky or dangerous areas where it sounds like you're talking about one thing when you're actually talking about another. And I'm not really happy with the term tripwire, although I understand it. The idea here is that these are reactions of elements in the situation which may or may not happen. They're focusing items for the game master. And the examples here are if character X is harmed in any way, this very clear reaction will be the result. Or if the threat's layer is disturbed in any way, this will be the very clear reaction. Now, these tripwires do not connect to each other. It is not at all required that they be tripped during play. It's just 
a way for, in my opinion, it's a way for the game master to start framing the situation in their mind so that other events can be interpreted accordingly and so that the nature of the components in play is clear. So as it's described in the book, they are prepared, not planned. These, these reactions will not happen in play unless the characters trip them, cause them to play. Now, in my own games, I do this a lot. I prepare something for each uh, component using this term in the situation. What will happen if this is messed with in a specific way? And it helps me get a grip on what that element is, who that character is, what that organization is, what this region is, right? And it has nothing to do with enforcing a story. It has everything to do with reinforcing character. The last step, excellently so, in my opinion, is to review everything you've done so far. Walk back through the checklist again, review what you are putting in place with a mind to assess it. Am I doing just what the step says or have I gone a step too far? It says to beware habits of story making. Right. That's not your job. Play makes the story in this game. So have you tied things together which shouldn't be tied? Have you planted some kind of hook which pulls people into conflict which is unnecessary? They will choose their conflicts as they will. This kind of thing. And it finishes off with a graphic which is just six boxes. These six boxes represent the preparation that you need to make a venture. This is it. Right? Named people, right? and the two named people that were used as examples in this section. Location, the two specific locations. Right? And tripwires, the two specific tripwires. And then the list of components, the little map and the threatening creature that is involved in the example venture. And that's it. Nothing else. This is just a visual representation to remind you of what's happening which is preparation, situation, not scenes. So the last two pages of chapter three, pages 68 and 69, are basically called Play Gets Going. There has a section on just before starting, then playing my character. It's a lot of bullet points here. And again, it's procedural. This is what you do to get ready for play with your components. You've got your characters, you have your venture, and you're ready to go. What do I do? Well, this is what you do. The Game Master will tell everyone these things only. Which region, the venture's approximate location within that region, and he will reveal one of the components, and it tells you exactly which one, the, the lowest numbered result, tell you which one to reveal. No details about it, no details about how they heard about it, and certainly no you have been compelled stuff, right? Just this is what you know, like a rumor kind of thing. If it's the first venture, the players will choose one of the two characters they made. The characters that they don't choose, go into the pool. The characters that they choose, they play. It's their character. At the end of this venture, that character will be returned to the pool and they must choose any one of the others. The only rule is that you cannot play the same character twice in a row. So you could alternate or you could work your way around through all the characters. The only rule is you can't play the same character twice in a row. So after this has been revealed, 
the players will choose this venture's character for themselves. It becomes their character. They will make some quick adjustments, such as which spells are they particularly focused on at this time. They do not consult with the person who has generated the character or has played the character in the past. They simply remember how the character is played in the past, and they look at the information on the character sheet, such as the key event, how they are armed, where they are from, what it says about them. Are they cunning and ambitious? They'll play that character. This brings to mind comic books, episodic television, long cycles of folklore, where Hundreds of authors maybe have had their hands on these characters, and yet intrinsically, somehow the character is the same. It's interesting. It's different. And it provides a, another opportunity of exploration that goes beyond just not having a pre-written story. It goes into opening yourself up to awareness of who this character is, an interpretation of who that character is, all at the same time. The last words in this chapter are intriguing hints, and I'm kind of enjoying going through this, limiting myself to chapter by chapter. The last words in this chapter are, a circle knight is not assigned to a venture or given a mission-oriented goal in it. Instead, he or she has heard about it and decided to go there with some companions. This has been mentioned several times. Right? So another reminder to beware the elements or the habits of story making. Second point, a circle knight likely suffers from one or more of these mildly. Headaches sleep disorders, sudden onsets of strong emotion. No explanation, just, oh, by the way. A circle knight profoundly understands both the reluctance and the willingness to kill. These are reminders, as, as players are settling into the role of their characters, these are reminders of the game that we are playing. Oh, by the way. Remember this, as a Circle Knight, you may experience the following things. Our next installment will look at Chapter 4, which is called Circle of Steel and moves us into scenes. Having been introduced to the backdrop and learning to create the situation, now we're ready to make scenes. Bring us to the point at page 71 of actual play. From here, we will learn more about how the game works. I hope you will join me for that chapter, and if you've come this far, thank you for watching.